Awesome, awesome, awesome. We are beginning today a brand new teaching series, and I'm going to kick it off today, and I'm going to kick it off next week. We'll do the first two weeks. Then we're going to take a one-week time out. I got a special guest coming in, Pastor Andre Butler. He's the son of Bishop Keith A. Butler from Detroit. He's going to be here for Father's Day, special treat for Father's Day. He's going to be here on Father's Day. Then we'll pick up back up after he's here with the last two weeks of this teaching series. And the teaching series is entitled The Promised Life. The Promised Life, subtitled Live Long and Live Well. <clears throat> and I'm setting the tone for this because one of the things I'm going to be doing over these next several weeks, I want to give you some spiritual as well as some natural wisdom on how to live this life the amount of time that God intended for us to live. And I'm going to tell you today, I'll show you today from the scripture how long God intended for man's life to be after man's sin. After the fall and all that, God set the parameters of what man's life should be. And I'll tell you a friend, it's not 30 years, it's not 40 years, it's not 50 years, it's not 60 years. God intends for us to live a much longer life than what most people are living today. But in order to do that, we've got to take care of the natural part of it as well as the spiritual part. Shout amen, somebody. And so I want to read to you from Psalm number 91. It's a very familiar passage of scripture to most, most folks. And I'm going to read it to you from the New Living Translation. <clears throat> you can follow along in whatever translation you have, or they'll have this translation listed there on the screen in just a moment. So Psalm number 91, beginning at verse 1, it says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge. He is my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. Anybody trust God today? For he will rescue you from every trap. He will protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrows, or we say the bullet that flies in the daytime. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness or the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, Though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. You ought to shout amen about that right there. Come on, that verse number seven is yours. Though a thousand may fall at your side, even if 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, watch this, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will do what? Come on, I will do what? I will answer them. I like this part right here. I will be with them in the middle of their trouble. I will rescue them. I will honor them. And I will reward them with a long life, and I will give them my salvation. God is speaking to the children of Israel, and he promises the Israelites that he's going to protect them. He's going to keep them from harm. He's going to deliver them from sickness. He's going to cause them to live a long, satisfied life. And what's really amazing is that when you go back and look at the context of this, which we're going to do in a second, you understand that when God is making this promise to the children of Israel, he's making this promise to them during that time that they were walking through the wilderness for 40 years. And you can imagine walking through the wilderness then is no different than walking through the wilderness now. There were wild animals out there. There was disease and, 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 and other uh, uh, dangers that were coming their way. And in the midst of all of that, while people are dropping dead from all types of tragedies and all types of illnesses and sicknesses, God says to them, if you put your trust in me, I can turn around and cause you to live a long life and a satisfied life. And what's amazing is when you really dive into the context of this, chapter 90 and chapter 91 of Psalms are two chapters that were written by Moses. Most of the Psalms, as many of you probably know, were written by David. David is the, is the human author of most of the Psalms. But these two chapters, chapter 90 and chapter 91, were actually written by Moses. And he writes these two chapters when the children of Israel are walking through the wilderness. But what's amazing is I believe that something that he says in chapter 90 has affected how long people are living today. Because when you look at the average life expectancy in America today, the average life expectancy in America today is 78.74 years. It's a little bit lower than that for men, a little bit higher than that for ladies. But on average, it's 78.74 
years. In 1970, when I was born, the average life expectancy actually was lower than that. It was 70.41 years. And if you go all the way back to 1900, at the turn of that century, the average life expectancy then was only 47 years. So with better medical technology, with better eating habits, with cleaner water and things like that, we've increased it to 1970 to 70 years of age. And today it's increased all the way up to 78. But can I tell you, that's still not God's best. And when you look at chapter 90 of Psalm, I want you, I want you to see something here. In chapter 90 of Psalms, <clears throat> verse number 1 again says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. And he says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Skip down to verse number 7. He goes on to say, For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. Now somebody say this with me. Say, he couldn't be talking to us. He be to us. Come on, I want you to say it again. Say, he couldn't be talking to us. Now, you say, well, you know, why can you say that, Pastor? Because he, he says here that we have been consumed by your anger. How I many know we're not being consumed by God's anger? Yeah. Are you still out there? Are you going home already? Yeah. We're not being consumed by God's anger. His wrath is not terrifying us. We're living in the grace of God. Come on, we get up every day and we thank God his mercies are new every morning. Yeah. So he couldn't be talking to us right here. I mean, it's it's kind of like if I looked out there and I said, come here, you little ugly thing, you. How many know you wouldn't jump up and say, what you need, Bishop? That's me. In fact, you probably look around and go, I know he ain't talking to me. I don't know who he's talking to, but he can't be talking to me. Why? Because I ain't no little ugly thing. Well, when he says here, we are consumed by your wrath, your anger. Your wrath has caused us to be terrified. He could not possibly be talking to us that are living under the grace that came from Christ Jesus. He goes on to say, you have set our iniquity before you. Our secret sins in the light of your countenance. All of our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. <sighs> the days of our lives, watch this, are 70 years. Now, the King James says three score years and 10. That means 70 years. And if by reason of strength they be 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off. And then this is where we get the song from We Fly Away. Oh, glory, I'll fly. Some of you Presbyterians can say amen to me out there. <laughs> well, now, right here is where most people set the barometer of what they expect their life to be. Because a passage here where Moses, everybody say Moses is talking. Moses. Come on, I can't hear you. Say it like me and say Moses is talking. Moses. A passage here where Moses is talking and Moses said, that the days of our lives are three score years and ten, 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, and then we fly away. Based on that, people have set their barometer at 70 to 80 years. And the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Which means if I start thinking at 70 or 80 is when, when I would expect to die, then how many know my body's going to start acting old when I turn 50? I'm already preaching better than you saying Amen. <laughs> And, and, and what you see in our society today is that the average lifespan of a man today is right there in the middle, 78 years of age. You know why? Because we've set our barometer thinking that 70 or 80 is old. Can I just tell you 70 is not old? Amen. 70 is not when you're supposed to start making plans to die. Amen. 80 is not when you're supposed to be making plans to die. 90 is not when you're supposed to be making plans to die. Which means when you're 30 and 40 and 50, you're not supposed to be walking around talking old, acting old, Living an old life. Don't walk around saying stuff like, man, I can't find my keys. You know what they say? The mind is the first thing to go. <laughs> well, you couldn't find your keys when you was 35. You just don't, you don't put your keys in the right place. Huh? But we start thinking old, acting old. Then we retire. And there's nothing wrong with retiring from your secular job, your, 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 your taxing 40, 50-hour week job. But when we retire as believers, we don't just go home and sit on the front porch on a rocking chair and do nothing. God has called us to be productive, and when we understand that he called us to live a long life, then we don't just sit back and wait to do nothing. When, when Moses was writing this right here in, in, in Psalm number 9, he wasn't talking to us. In fact, what he was doing, he was being a news reporter. Moses was looking around during that season when the children of Israel were walking through the wilderness, during that time when God said, because they didn't believe that I could take them to the promised land, I'm going to take their children to the promised land, but the adults are going to die here in the wilderness. So what Moses was saying is, as I look around, I see folks dying at 70. Some that are real strong are making it to 80. But then what he's saying in chapter 
uh, 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 chapter 91 is that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High doesn't have to die at 70 or 80. He's saying the one that abides under the shadow of the Almighty doesn't have to worry about the disease that shows up or the arrow that flies in the middle of the day. The one that puts his trust in God with long life, God will satisfy him and show him his salvation. Which means for us today, God's barometer for us, his target for us should not be 70 years, should not be 80 years. I'm going to show you from Scripture what the span of a man's life is based on what God said. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. What is the span of a man's life? Genesis chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. For he is indeed flesh, watch this, yet his days shall be, watch this, 100 and what? Come on, 100 and what? 120 years. Notice who's talking in verse number 3, the Lord said. In Psalm number 90, when it says 70 or 80 years, that was Moses talking. Genesis chapter 6, how many know God's word is a little bit higher than Moses' word? God's word said that the days of man shall be 120 years. And I know you look at that and you go, wow, man, I don't know anybody that's ever lived to be 120 years. That's far-fetched to believe that anybody can live to be 120 years. Well, when you go back and think about the time when this was written, at that time before he says this, men were living to be 900 years old. Some were living to be 700 years old. In fact, if you got cut off in puberty, you were 400 years old. And now all of a sudden, God looked around and said, man, this sin thing has caused men to become so wicked, so wretched that if they live too long, they'll destroy themselves. Man's life is going to become 120 years. He shortened it to 120 years on this earth. And what's amazing is I love that the Bible and science are not at odds with each other. So many times we think that, you know, the Bible and science are, are, are in conflict with each other. They're really not. Even the whole Jurassic Age, I believe that the Bible absolutely accounts for the Jurassic Age. I do. I don't have time to, to dive into it today. But even scientists, medical science, has something called the Hayflick effect or the Hayflick limit. And the Hayflick limit says that the cells in our bodies are able to reproduce approximately 50 times before they die out. And based on those cells reproducing about 50 times, man should be able to live up to 120 years. And they spent all that research money, took all that time to figure that out. I could have told them that. Why? Because God said it. That's that. So the Bible says, but even medical science has turned around and agrees with it. Now, said all that to say this. If the span of a man's life is 120 years, how many know we aren't supposed to be dying at 60? Amen. It's not God's will for us to leave here at 75. It's God's will that we live a long, satisfied life. And I'm not talking about getting to 120 and you are barely able to move. Can't see your family. He said, what if I don't make it to 120? Well, if you fall short and end up at 101, that's still pretty good. If you end up at 98, 99, that's still pretty good. And especially if you end up at 98, 99, 105, and you're still healthy. Come on, somebody. You still got your mental faculties. You got your eyesight. The Bible says that Moses became, lived to be 120 years of age. His eyesight didn't grow down, and his natural force was not abated, which means if he wanted to have a baby, he could have had a baby. I don't know about y'all. Y'all acting deep and spiritual. I'm claiming that today, man. I'm claiming I'll be 100 years old, still chasing April around. Bring yourself here, girl. Come on, come on. I might be moving a little bit slower, but come on over here, girl. Why? Because God made a promise to us, and we need to understand that it's not just up to God. There's things that God has to do for it, but there's also things that we've got to do. Amen. And part of it is we need to understand the purpose. What's the reason why God has granted us this, this promise of long life? What's the purpose for our longevity? My friend Miles Monroe, who's gone home to be with the Lord, he made this statement over and over. He says, when purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. Whenever purpose is unknown, when we don't understand the reason why a certain thing is a certain way, then abuse is inevitable, which means if we don't understand why God wants to satisfy us with long life, then we'll spend whatever time we have on this earth chasing after the wrong stuff. 
I mean, what's the, what's the use of living 120 years if I spend 120 years doing the opposite of what God wants? So there's a reason why God is granting us this promised life of long life. And it's found in Isaiah 43, verse 7. He says, I want them back, every last one who bears my name. He says, I want every man, I want every woman, and I want every child, watch this, who I created for my what? Come on, who I created for my what? For my glory. Yes, personally formed, and I made each one of them. We've been created to bring glory to God, to bring pleasure to God with everything that we possess. That means whatever time we have, we're supposed to use it to bring glory to God. Whatever talent we have, we're supposed to use it to bring glory to God. Whatever treasure we have, whatever relationships we have, whatever influence we have, whatever platform God has given us is not so we can pop our collar and tell everybody how great we are. Whatever God has given us, the, the, the car God has blessed you with is not for you to ride around and have everybody say how good you look in your car. Even the car God has given you, the house he's given you, is intended to be a vehicle for us to bring glory to God. And when God gr grants us with long life, it allows us to live a longer time on the earth to bring glory to him for a longer time. Now, there are five pillars of health that I want to give you that I believe are essential if we're going to live this long, satisfied life that God has promised. One of them is spiritual and the rest of them are really natural. The first one is we got to live righteously. Thank you for that one amen. God bless you, sister. <laughs> we got to live righteously. <laughs> Number two, we got to have proper nutrition. Thank you. They're rolling in slowly, but thank you as they come. <laughs> I'll say it again. We got to have proper nutrition. Amen. That means we got to eat the right stuff. How many know that, that some of this long life that God has promised us is based on us taking care of these bodies the right way? Amen. Come on, these bodies are a machine. Yes. Which means we can't, because a lot of times what happens, especially in church circles, this only happens in church. Folks in the world don't do this. Folks in the world, honestly, are more honest with themselves sometimes than church people. Church people, we will sit up and we'll have a pork chop in his hand, <laughs> salt shaker in his hand. <laughs> Huh? Fat back in our greens over here. <laughs> Tearing it up. And then we get done, we want to come to the church, have somebody put some oil on our forehead to deal with our high blood pressure. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. amen. Hmm? Well, no, it, it's not just spiritual. It's spiritual and natural, which means if I want to see my blood pressure come down, yes, I need to pray for the healing power of God, but I also need to educate myself on how this body works. Because watch this, when, you're, when your blood pressure is up, can I just give you a little secret? Your blood pressure is not up because it's lacking blood pressure medicine. See, we go to doctor. me. Thank God I love doctors. We have doctors in here. We have surgeons in here. We have nurses in here. We love them. But we have righteous doctors and nurses in here. But the worldly doctors and nurses, a lot of times they don't want to take time to find out what's going on with your body. They got you on a 15-minute cycle to get as many people in that room as they can. So you know what they want to do? Want to hear you tell them what's going on. They take your blood pressure and they give you a pill, say, go take this. Huh? Your body's not lacking blood pressure medicine. There's something going on on the inside of your body that's causing your pressure to go up. It's better to slow down long enough to find out what that is. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Instead of leaving here early, then somebody stand up and, and ignorantly say the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. God needed a flower in heaven. God didn't need a flower in heaven. He needed you to stop eating so many pork chops. Now, you get mad at me this soon. I got a lot more information here. <laughs> we need to live righteously. Come on, somebody. We need proper nutrition. Watch this. We need physical fitness. Come on, elbow your neighbor and say, it's getting real awkward sitting next to you. <laughs> we got to move these bodies, man. Next week, I'm, I'm going to get into it a little bit at the end of next week. But we, we got to move these bodies. You know your body is 60-plus is percent water? Hmm? we got to move these bodies. We need physical fitness. Third thing, we, fourth thing we need is adequate sleep. That's the first time you said amen all day. Yeah. Yeah. We need, I need more sleep. Yes, yes, Reverend. And number five, we need stress control. Five pillars that we need. We need to live righteously. 
We need proper nutrition. We need physical fitness. We need adequate sleep. And we got to learn how to deal with these loads of stress. We look up today and you have teenagers that have stress. You got seven, eight-year-old kids walking around with stress. We got to learn how to deal with these things because these are the things that I'm talking to you about right now that are cutting people's lives short. And we blame it on the devil. Sometimes we blame it on God. But if the truth be told, if we just did a better job of taking care of these amazing machines God has given us, this amazing gift he's given us called the human body, these bodies can last a lot longer than what the average lifespan is today. So let me spend the rest of my time today dealing with this first one, living righteously. Because there are certain things that we can do, the Bible says, that can add years to our lives. And there's certain things we can do that can take away years from our lives. Now, it's important that we understand what we're starting with. Because if we think we're starting at 70 years old and adding, then that's different. But no, remember, we're starting at 120. God set the span of a man's life at 120. Which means there's some things we can do that may take that back to 118. There's some things we can do that can make that cross the threshold of 121, 122. And we need to make sure we're paying attention to the first thing that the Bible says that we've got to make sure we're living in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Proverbs 10, 27 says this. The fear of the Lord lengthens one's life. But the years of the wicked are cut short. I mean, that's the one we ought to pay attention to. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. Anybody interested in living a long time? Well, now the Bible says the fear of the Lord can lengthen your life. The fear of the Lord can add years to our lives, but the wicked will be cut short. What is the fear of the Lord? I mean, in a nutshell, the fear of the Lord is a deep respect for God. And when we have a deep respect for God, then it causes us to consider our decisions in the light of what God would think about it instead of just what other people think about it. Everything we get ready to do, it makes us run it through this filter of, is God okay with this? I don't just take off and do things on my own, and, and I'm okay with it. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what that church says. I'm grown. Nobody tell me what to do. Well, I, I mean, you, I, you're definitely grown. Growner than I am, some of you. But it's not a matter of what Bishop Davis or the pastor has to say about it. The fear of God is what causes us to stop and say, hang on a second. Before I do this, is this okay with God? The fear of the Lord will keep us from doing things that we know violate God's standard. We know God loves us unconditionally. But the fear of the Lord keeps us from making decisions that will grieve his heart or violate his holy standard. And can I just say this? Every one of us in here can, can stand to grow some more in the fear of the Lord. Because one of the things that, I, that I, I've realized in, in the many years I've been pastoring now is I'm, I'm grateful to God that, that the church has loosened up some. And, and I, I'm glad I don't have to stand up in a nine-piece suit to preach to you today. I like preaching in jeans, man, and, and a shirt. I, I like being comfortable. But guess what? Comfort on the outside should not mean becoming too casual with God on the inside. And sometimes in, in the midst of the lights and the haze machine and, and the jeans and the gym shoes and, and coming with the hat on, I'm okay with that if that's what it takes to get us to Christ. But there's still got to be this attitude that says, hang on a second, I'm grateful to God because God is not just like my buddy sitting next to me. Thank God I'm a friend of God, but at the end of the day, he is still the most high God. At the end of the day, I still get up every day, and I'm grateful that he's even willing to look in my direction, which means he owes us nothing whatsoever. If God never did anything else for us for the rest of our lives, we still owe him worship. We still owe him praise, not because of what he does for us, simply because he is God Almighty. And there's a place of honor and reverence that we got to make sure we don't lose in the church and in the family of God because we live in a society today that does not recognize the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, watch this, will keep us from putting poisonous substances into our bodies. When I fear God, it'll keep me from chiefing. it keep the weed out your system when you fear God. Now, it, you, you do better if you just say amen and look straight ahead. Don't look, you start twitching and looking all around. That, that, that makes you look real suspicious. Come on. The fear of God. Come on. It's not a matter of somebody else seeing me or catching me, but the fear of the Lord will keep me out of unnecessary disputes that could cause me to end up getting killed prematurely. How many folks are dead right now prematurely because... They couldn't just walk away from the argument. How many folks are dead right now, man? Because they got into an argument and somebody cut them off in traffic. 
And instead of, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic, you know what the first thing you ought to do? Not jump in the lane and, and chase them. First thing you ought to do is thank God that your car didn't flip over, your kids didn't die. And when there's a fear of the Lord, you stop and thank God, how, how does God fit into this context? I'm grateful to God that when they cut me off in traffic, the angels of God kept me alert enough that I was able to stop. It didn't tear my car, but it didn't destroy my life. Instead of letting the flesh tell me to go chasing after them, blowing my horn at them, you don't know what kind of fool is in that other car. Say you've had folks in a, in a road rage, somebody pull out a gun, shoot somebody dead. And then, you know, the first thing we say, why did God let that happen? The fear of the Lord will produce enough wisdom, watch this, to help us wear our seat belts all the time. Hmm? Come on, somebody. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a constant reminder that there's not much good happening outside in the middle of the night. Come on. I mean, the fear of the Lord will have you at home at a reasonable time. Not because I, I, you're not grown. Everybody know you're grown. You look grown. You've been looking grown. <laughs> That's not the issue. But the fear of the Lord will help remind you that there's nothing good happening out there in the middle of the night. In fact, one of our local news stations, News for Jack, said they have something called the I-Team. And they did a, 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 a story here. They did a, some, some research to figure out what is the most deadly time of the night when it comes to violent crimes. And what they determined is the closer you get to midnight, the more dangerous it gets. So the hours leading up to midnight and the hours coming right out of midnight are the most dangerous times there are. When I watch this, we got enough sense to know that if you're leaving from work and you know 295 is going to be a bunch of traffic, guess what? You go a different way. Well, if we got that much sense to deal with traffic, how many know we ought to have enough sense to know if most of the deadly crimes are happening in the middle of the night when they ain't got no business being out anyway? then if I don't have to come from work or something else, it probably makes sense for me to use some of that wisdom God gave me. Come on, somebody. Amen. To let myself be at home instead of out there where there's a greater chance of something bad happening to me. Amen. We need to fear the Lord. Second thing we got to do, we got to speak life. We got to speak life. If we're going to live a long time, we got to speak life. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. The Message Bible says it this way. I love this. It says, words kill, words give life. They are either poison or fruit, but you got to choose. All right, isn't that good? I mean, that, that's, that's right in line with what the Bible tells us in James chapter 3. You can read it later. In the book of James chapter 3, it says that the tongue is equated to or is, is compared to the bit that we put in a horse's mouth. So you can make the horse go left or right. And it compares the tongue to the rudder on the bottom of the ship. In other words, that big, huge uh, uh, cruise ship out there, if you look up under it, co comparatively speaking, there's a small rudder under that ship. And that rudder determines if that ship is going to go to the left or the right. The Bible says your tongue is just like that bit in the horse's mouth, just like that rudder on the ship, which means whichever direction your tongue goes, it's going to take your life with it. You know, you know what that means? That means that we can't just walk around speaking death and destruction and poverty, and lack, and I can't make it. And every time I take two steps forward, I get knocked three steps back. And it's so hard to get ahead in this life. And because that Donald Trump is in office, my life has been destroyed. You can't talk all that. <laughs> and then expect life to show up in your life. Huh? No, we've got to be among those people who realize that the words that I speak out of my mouth, they really do matter. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Come on, say amen, somebody. In fact, everything we do, the Bible tells us to imitate our Father God. The Bible says this about God, Romans 4, 17. It says, God who gives life to the dead, and he calls those things which do not exist as though they did exist. That's what God does. God didn't look at the situation and talk about how bad it is. When he looked at the earth and saw that the earth was dark, he didn't, in Genesis 1, he didn't say, man, it's dark out here. He looked at darkness, and he called for light. The Bible says we're supposed to imitate him, which means we don't look at our circumstance, just spend all of our time talking about how bad it is. We declare what God's word says about it until God's word changes the situation. You know, I was talking to uh, Pastor, uh, 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 Principal David Patterson this week. He and I were sitting down, and we were talking, and he shared this stat with me. I had heard it before, but, but he reminded me of it. He says, we remember 10% of what we read. We remember 20% of what we hear, 30% 
of what we see, 50% of what we hear and see. But watch this. But we remember 70% of what we say. Which means a week from now, you remember 10% of what you just read, 30% of what you've seen, but we remember 70% of what we say out of our own mouths. That's why the devil has done one of the most masterful jobs in the history of the world, to get us to open up our mouths and speak death and destruction out of our mouths. It started all the way back in Genesis. As soon as Adam sinned, one of the first things he did that came out of his mouth when God came looking for him, God says, where were you? He says, I heard you coming and I hid myself because, watch this, I was afraid. And when those words came out of his mouth, I was afraid, the death cycle kicked in on overdrive. It took 930 years for the devil to figure out how to kill this first guy. It doesn't take him that long now, man. Even when we think we, we're doing something, we make it to 78 years. But you look around, man, there, there's, there's a lot of folks dying a whole lot sooner than that. And I'm telling you, some of it comes because of the words that are coming out of our mouths. Because it's not just what we say when we say stuff like, oh, I, I'm, I'm sick as a dog today. I'm talking about even he's learned how to interweave death and destruction into our music. He's got you paying for music to listen to, to speak about death and destruction. Huh? Calling females all kind of words out of their name. Huh? Talking about who you, we're shooting and killing and destroying. I'm preaching better than you saying Amen. I had this conversation with my kids because, you know, you know, a lot of Christians, a lot of pastors especially, kind of live with their kids where you are not going to listen to this music, this music in my house. We, we've never been that way with our kids. Because in our generation with our kids, when you got iPhones and iPads and, and iPods, it's just too hard to police that, man. Because the moment you walk away and you've, you've ordered them, don't you dare listen to that. As soon as you walk away, they're going to listen to it anyway. And with headphones on, you don't know what they listen to in there. So, you know, what we did ever since they were kids, we taught our kids how to listen to the lyrics in a song. And you need to make it up in your mind. Do you really want something that's death and destruction filled coming into your spirit? Now, am I saying that my kids have always listened to the right stuff? I'm not saying that at all, man. I'm sure they, I'm sure they listen to some stuff that they probably shouldn't be listening to. But at the end of the day, we tell them when you leave this house, you don't get to take the benefits of this house with you. So if you want to live as an adult the way you live growing up, you better make some decisions that are like the ones your mom and daddy made that caused us to have the life that you grew up with. And so last year, I was, you know, we were on summer vacation with our kids, and, and uh, my daughter was listening to the song. She, she wasn't listening to it in headphones. She was just listening to it. And I was listening to the lyrics. It's a song by this guy, Khalid. I guess his name, his name is Khalid. Khalid. Uh, you can laugh. I don't know. I don't really care. <laughs> I don't really care what his name is. <laughs> but the <this, laughs> The song, the song that the guy was singing, the, the lyrics are young, dumb, and broke. And he basically is, 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 is saying that, you know, I looked at the video, and, and he's a kid. He's talking about how high he is, and I'm just young, dumb, and broke. And he's singing it over and over, and the kids are singing it, young, dumb, and broke. And I listened to my, my kid, my daughter, I said, I said you, are you, you really realize what you're singing? It's just a song. I said, but the song says you, you're young, dumb, and broke high school kids. I said, well, if that's the case, well, come here with your little young, dumb, broke self then. <laughs> when, I watched it, when I called her young, dumb, and broke, they didn't want to hear that. I said, but if you don't realize, the enemy has tricked us into thinking all it is is a song. But in reality, he put a tune to it, put a beat to it, and got the words to come out of your mouth. And you're going to believe 70% of what comes out of your own mouth. Your spirit, man, <laughs> becomes twisted. When you let words come out of your mouth that are inconsistent with the Word of God, somebody ought to shout amen. amen. Come on, somebody ought to shout amen better than that. Amen. In fact, somebody say this. Say, in the name of Jesus, amen. I declare amen. I am amen. the blessed of the Lord. Amen. Come on, I'm blessed in the city. Amen. I'm blessed in the field. Amen. I'm blessed in the basket. Amen. I'm blessed in the store. Amen. I'm blessed when I come in. Amen. I'm blessed when I go out. Amen. Come on, I'm the head, amen. not the tail. Above only, never beneath. I will live my full number of days. I will not die prematurely, but I will live and declare the works of God. I am blessed in every area. My body is blessed. No sickness or disease has any right in this body. Come on, every organ, every fiber, every tissue of this body functions perfectly. No sickness 
or disease can live in this body. This body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. My mind is alert. My eyes are strong. My bones are strong. My blood is perfect because I am the redeemed of the Lord. My money is blessed. I give is given unto me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Men give to me. I'm generous, and it comes back to me. I am blessed. Come on, I am blessed. I am blessed because I am his, and he is mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, you ought to shout if you believe that. Come on, you ought to shout if you believe that, man. Praise God. Now watch, watch this. Can you tell the difference in how much life just showed up in here? Wow, when you speak life out of your mouth, your cells respond to that. The blood in your body responds to that. Your metabolism will respond to that. I've been speaking to mine. You just speed your little self up. <laughs> uh, your whole body will respond to you speaking words of life, right? So we need to walk in the fear of the Lord. We need to speak life. And watch this, the last one today. We need to practice honor. We need to practice honor. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse number 1. It says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Notice it says, children, the right thing to do is to do what your parents tell you to do. Now, I want you to understand the context of it because he says, children, obey your parents and the Lord. The next thing he goes on to say is to honor your father and your mother. So when we are children, which means, how do you know when you're a child? When you're in your parents' house, when you're sleeping in their bed, eating their food, wearing their clothes, under their roof, you is a child, even if you is 18. <laughs> 18 is not some magic number where all of a sudden I'm grown. I don't have to do what anybody tells No, 18 means you can legally do some things you couldn't do before. But can I just say, we're not really grown, grown until we can take care of ourselves. Amen. Come on, somebody, come on. We're not grown, grown until we can take care of ourselves. As long as the clothes I got on and the food I got to eat every day comes from my mother or father or whoever's taking care of me. Even if I'm 35. I mean, to this day, if I to this day had to move back into my mother's house, I'm a grown man, but all of a sudden I become a child in her house because if she says she wants everybody in, the, in this house in by midnight, then if I want to live there, I need to be in by midnight. Hmm? So when we're under submission or dependent upon our parent, we're in that role of children. The Bible says, obey, do what you're told to do. We never outgrow the next part of it. The next part says, honor your father and your mother. Even when you are grown, grown. We never get to the place where we're so grown that we don't have to honor our father and mother. And the Bible says this, honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. Paul said the first commandment that God gave us that had a promise attached to it was this one right here. If you look at the, in, in the book of Exodus, the rest of the commandments he gave, the first one, you know, the, don't have any other gods before me. Don't make any graven image. Well, he told us what to do, but didn't give us a promise. This is the first promise that he got to where he says, honor your father and your mother. And by the way, if you do so, things will go well with you and you will live a long time on the earth. You know what that also says to me? If I don't honor my father and mother, things aren't going to go well for me. Which means if I dishonor my father and mother, well, I can run up and throw all the money I want to throw on the stage. My, my, my finances aren't going to be blessed. I can confess all I want. I'm the blessed of the Lord. I won't have favor on my life if I don't honor my mother and father. Are you still with me today? He says, honor your father and mother. Things will go well for you and you'll live a long time. I believe with all my heart, one of the reasons why you turn on the news every single day and it grieves my heart. And you see teenagers, young adults getting taken out in the prime of their life, man. I think one reason why is because we've created a culture of dishonor. It's not just with parents, it's with authority, period, man. We live in a generation today, and I'm not just talking about young people, because some of, some of what the young people get is what they see their parents doing. We live in a culture today where nobody wants to be told to do anything, man. And in that culture of dishonor, 
it creates a scenario where, just like it says here, if you don't honor those that God has put in authority over you, things aren't going to go right for you. You're not going to live a long time on the earth. And I believe we have now entered the third or fourth, maybe even the fifth generation now of dishonor. I think it started in the 50s and 60s and with the Vietnam War protests. It kind of started that rebellion against authority. And then with the Woodstock and the hippie generation. Then when I grew up, my generation was that generation that, that, had, that, that, that showed dishonor where you had a little kid in the grocery store. And the mama said, put that gun back. And he'd get mad and fall out on the floor. Now, that wasn't me. If it had been me, I wouldn't be here preaching to y'all right now. <laughs> so my mama didn't play that. My mother was a type, if you show out in public, I'll whoop you behind in public. But I watch parents, man, kids fall out in the middle of the grocery store, and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus. It's about to go down right now. I'm like, oh, we're about to see something right now. And you see the mother run over, little Johnny, get up. Don't make me count to 212. But then today is now, because now little Johnny is now a parent. So today, you know what? It's not just falling out in the grocery store. Now you got kids coming home shooting their parents, going to school with guns, shooting their teachers, because we live in a culture of dishonor. And I'm saying to you as a church, we got to restore the honor, man. We got to restore the honor. Can I get an amen from somebody? You say, what does the word honor mean? It comes from a Greek word, kabod. It means to be heavy. It means to be weighty. It means to honor, or literally means to treat like a heavyweight. In other words, when it comes to your mother and father, prize them. Treat them like they're heavyweights. Don't treat them like a lightweight. There are lots of people that call me, and I try to call them back as soon as I can, try to text them back as soon as I can, but if my mother or father texts me, I'm going to do everything I can to get back in touch with them. If they ask me for something, if it's in my ability to do it, I'm going to try to do it. You know why? I'm not going to treat them like a lightweight. But treat them like a heavyweight. Can I just read, read one more note to you and I'm done? Honoring your father and mother is being respectful in word and action. And it's having an inward attitude of esteem for their position. Honor is giving respect not only for their merit, but also for their rank. For example, some Americans may disagree with the president's decisions, but we should still respect the position as leader of our country. Similarly... Children of all ages should honor their parents, watch this, regardless of whether or not their parents deserve honor. Is that right? I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to help you to understand when you look at the news, you see some of the tragedies that we see. I'm not saying that the, anybody that gets killed is because they dishonored their parents. I'm saying we've created a culture of dishonor. And when we create a culture like that, if we want to rise above that where a 1,000 fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it doesn't come near us, we got to make sure that we are the ones that are doing the best thing that we can to fear the Lord, speak words of life, and honor the people that God has placed in authority over us. Come on, lift your hands. Thank you, Father, for your word today. Thank you for this grace that we live. Thank you for this grace that we stand in. And, Father, I thank you right now for letting this anchor into our hearts. Change us, Lord God. Help us to change. If we've been the ones making decisions that don't line up with what you just spoke into our hearts, we commit today, Father God, we will be better. We'll make better decisions, better commitments to honor you. We thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Now every head is bowed and all eyes are closed in prayer. No one's moving, please, except those we've assigned to do so. All heads are bowed, eyes are closed in prayer. If you're here today, you do not know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Can I just say that starting the process with God starts with honoring him? It means recognize that you will never be good enough to earn a relationship with God. No matter how good you are on your best day, it would never be enough to have a relationship with a holy God. So he fixed the problem for us. He sent his son Jesus to the earth. He died for all of our sins so that by believing in him and yielding our lives in faith and confidence in him, his blood washes away all of our sin and God brings us into relationship with him. So if you're here today, and another way of saying it is just this. If you were to walk out of here today and breathe your last breath, do you know where you'd go? I don't mean do you know where you'd like to go. Do you know for certain where you'd go? If you cannot say with certainty that you'd go to heaven to be with the Lord, I'm going to ask you, ma'am or sir, teenager, will you please let me pray for you today? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you here to the front of the church. I'm going to pray for you right there at your seat where you are. And God is going to transform your life on this beautiful Sunday morning. So if you say, yes, pastor, you just described me. 
include me in on this prayer. Then let me know right now that I'm praying for you by lifting up your hand right there where you are. Come on, all over the building. Hands are going up. Thank you. See that hand there? Thank you. Another hand there. Come on, who else? Come on, who else? Another hand there. Thank you. Another hand right there. Thank you. Another hand there. Thank you, ushers. Come on, who else? Who else will say, yes, pastor, you just described me. Thank you for two hands in our overflow room over there. Anybody else over in our overflow room? Anybody in the cafe right now? Anybody online that I'm talking to? Anybody at, at Montgomery or Correctional Facility or Lottie or Lowell? We say, yes, pastor, I, I know you're talking to me. Right now, I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. Go ahead and say yes and just shoot your hand up right there where you are. Come on, shoot it up before you have a chance to talk yourself out. Thank you. Another hand there, another hand there, another hand there. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Another hand right there. Anyone else before we pray? All right, I want to ask everybody in here that raised your hand for prayer. Pray this prayer out loud with me. Just pray loud enough for you and God to hear it. And God's going to meet you right there at your seat. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody today to pray this, even if you're already saved. Let's pray this together in support of those that raised their hand. And God's going to transform the lives of those who are saying yes to him. Come on, say this out loud. Say, dear God in heaven, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is your son. He died for me paid the price for my sins but you raised him from the dead and he's alive right now I'm asking you Jesus come into my heart now save me now forgive me for trying to live life without you I surrender my whole life to you and for the rest of my days I am completely yours according to the Bible I am right now born again amen come on put your hands together help me celebrate with these men and women Come on, all over the room, man. Come on, all over the room and in the overflow room. Online, I'm sure. Praise God. Every one of you that raised your hand and prayed that prayer along with me, I want to ask you to do something for me. There's a little white card in the seat pocket. It looks like this. It's called a connection card. Will you fill that card out if you have not done so already today? Check the box that says, I committed my life to Christ. And when you finish with that card, give it to one of the ushers in the blue shirts or put it into the offering bucket when it comes by in a second. We're not going to call or stop by your house. I want to personally send you a letter that will give you some next steps to let you know what to do now that you've given your heart to Jesus Christ. Two things I'll tell you right away. You can do those today. First thing you ought to do is get baptized as soon as you can. And when this service ends, we'll have our baptism service right out front. We would love to baptize you today. And we'll even give you clothes and everything, towels, whatever you need, if you didn't come prepared for that. See one of the ushers for that. Second thing is get, get plugged into a good Bible teaching church right away. Get plugged into a church that's going to teach you the Word of God, give you an opportunity to worship God. And if you want information on becoming a member here at Impact, you can go right upstairs. Our 12 noon growth track class today is the perfect day because today's class is the actual membership class. You'll be a member after taking the class today. It's about an hour long. If you want to do that, you can see one of the ushers for that as well. Put your hands together again. Help me congratulate these men and women. Come on and keep on clapping as we thank God for this privilege we have to worship him with our giving. God is so good to us. If you need an offering envelope, there should be one right there in the seat pocket in front of you. If you're not, if you don't have one there in front of you, raise your hand. Our ushers will be glad to give you one. If you need one of our green and blue I give online cards, they'll be glad to give you that as well. We're going to pray over your offering in just a few moments and declare God's blessings over your house. I'm just declaring God is supernaturally invading your home with his abundance. I'm reading to you from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says, Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and give him the best. The result is that your barns will burst and your wine vats will brim over. In other words, when we bring God the first that we have to offer, the best that we have to offer. That means the first 10%. Not just any 10% is a tie. The first 10%. Before we spend some on bills and some at the mall and some on other stuff, the first 10% we sanctify and bring it to God. And the first 10% blesses the other 90%. And when we do that, the Bible says your barns will burst open, will, will spill over, be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. That means your bank accounts will, will, will be filled. That means that your investments will expand. But even with that, same as I said with the physical, we got to do the natural part as well to give God some room to work with. Amen? Go ahead and lift up your offering. Thank you, Father, for the privilege we have to worship you now. We bring this to you as our act of honor. We thank you for blessing it, increasing it, we declare that the budget of Impact Church is met. The budget of every home sowing into this ministry is met. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you may receive the offering. Once that bucket passes your row, go ahead and stand and join our worship team as they lead us out.